All right. So uh, thanks everyone for uh, joining in. This is uh, part of my monthly office hours series, which is part of my Patreon artist mentorship program. If you're not familiar with it, I have a mentorship program where I take on a few mentees and we have monthly one on one calls where we talk about music productions, DJs, strategy, social media, sometimes just a shoulder to cry on. And um, it's a program that I find really rewarding. I love having that one to one connection with people and helping people move forward. Outside the one-on-one -on -one sessions, we have monthly group calls, and um, sometimes they have topics, sometimes they don't. For this month, the topic is artist bookings, and I'm very happy to have a guest for this month's Office Hours, who is Gunita Nagpal, and I'm not even sure where to begin with my relationship with Gunita. Um, I suppose the most relevant uh, detail uh, with my relationship with Gunita is she's my booking agent. She's been my booking agent for what, 11 years now? Yeah, I think so. I think, uh, yeah. wow. at least, definitely at least a decade. Uh, Ganita has uh, believed in me and, and pushed me from before the beginning. And, um, you know, I, I owe a lot of my uh, success and, and career growth uh, due to her. And um, beyond her being my booking agent, uh, she's a close, very, very close dear friend uh, borderline family member, and um, just can't say enough positive things uh, about Ganita and, and the time that I've had with her. Um, a little bit more about uh, Ganita, um, outside the bookings that she's done with me, uh, you've been in the industry, I mean, working in the industry for what, at least 15 years, I think. Uh, yeah, part... actually over 15 years. I started, I mean, I informally started in 2005. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we're looking at 16, 17 years. You started as yeah. a party, you, you quit your job as an accountant to uh, become a party promoter. And then eventually you started a, a booking agency called Listed Bookings. And um, within the industry, uh, you're someone who uh, is very highly regarded, respected, you know everyone. Um, many people describe you as one of the good ones, which is a, a rare breed uh, in, in, in this industry. Um, You've represented artists, uh, you know, outside myself, Patrice Baumel, Maceo Plex, Cassie, <laughs> Mikey Lyon, Who Made Who, Shonky, and I mean, I think if we were to compile a list of everyone you've represented, it would, might be over a hundred different, hundred different DJs. Yeah, quite a few artists. Yeah. And um, yeah, so I'm, I'm happy to have you here. And the goal of this session is for us just to talk about um, really the most asked question that I have, whether it's my Patreon artist mentee sessions, whether it's people hitting me up on Instagram, up and coming DJs that are talking to in, in person, they're saying, how do I get gigs? Do I need a booking agent? How do I get a booking agent? What's going to happen? Um, how does the world of booking work? And um, I think you are the most qualified person I know to uh, answer many of these questions and help me, many of the attendees understand the industry a little bit better and uh, have a think about how their trajectory could move forward. So yeah. Anything that I missed, Kenita, or anything that you want to add about uh, your world? No, of dance I mean, music? I, I informally, I, I said I, I informally started uh, in 2005, uh, but really I started dance music in the early 90s. <laughs> uh, I, I was a true raver. I, I used to go starting at, you know, I was in college and I used to go raving and I went to school in the Midwest, so that's kind of where my dance music career kind of kicked off, but I didn't really take it seriously till 2005, and it wasn't actually with the, the booking agency, it was, uh, I threw a party, <laughs> uh, and the first party I ever threw was a Love Parade weekend in San Francisco, uh, the first Love Parade, uh, and the first party I ever threw was with Lee Burridge. Uh, so that's kind of what kicked off uh, me delving kind of deeper into dance music. So it, all, it actually all started with parties, throwing parties. Uh, and I just, you know, as Atish said, I, I wor I've worked in corporate environments. So I, I've worked with everything from a bank to macromedia to like um, public, a media publishing company. And I basically have brought my skills from that corp, from the corporate to starting my own dance music brand. Um, 
which is called Listed. Um, and it was really the parties that got me into bookings. Uh, the bookings, uh, the reason, like at, at the time when we started the booking agency, which was not right away, I believe it was like 2007 or 2008. I can't remember the exact, exact year, but um, the reason we kind of started the booking agency with Listed is I had a core group of residents. Uh, they were called, they were the Listed residents and uh, they comprised of, you know, Naveen G, Dory, Hackley, uh, Nikita, and am I missing anyone? Hoge. Um, Hoge, Hoge. And that's, that's actually how the booking agency started. And at the time I had a partner named Jonathan uh, Jonathan is no longer in dance music. He He's a, still a really good friend of mine, um, but uh, it was sort of his idea to be like, look, we have all these residents, why like people want to book them. Maybe we should start a bookings branch of Listed. And that's kind, that's kind of how it sort of organically came to being. So that just, and then, I mean, if I, if I were to say anything else, you know, I still like throw events from time to time, but my primary focus is the bookings. Um, I did, you know, uh, I did for a few years work with City Fox, which, you know, is pretty pivotal to where I'm at. I, I don't think I would be in this place without City Fox actually, because it, it taught me a lot of things. Um, me and my cousin Simmer helped develop the entire City Fox experience brand. Um, so without without that key relationship, I, I couldn't say I would be in this position right now. Yep. So that, that's what gives you a little introduction. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Um, and then just as a note, uh, if any of you have questions, um, I'm gonna try and uh, save like 10, 15 minutes at the end for questions, but feel free to toss them in the chat or if it's really pressing to a question that you're itching right now, uh, you can use the raise hand feature. It's under reactions and you can just raise your hand and uh, I'll unmute you. But uh, in the chat or saving it for the end is, is the best. Um, on that note, I have a bunch of questions for you, Ganita. Um, we probably won't even get through them all in this hour. So let's just- I'll, try, the... to, I'll try to go as fast as I can. <laughs> okay, well, whatever works, um, you know, and yeah, people can ask all up questions. And, you know, if we don't get to them all, maybe I can have you back in a future month to, to get in some more details. Um, so let's just start with a uh, super high level. What does a booking agent actually do? Um, well, a booking agent, you know, essentially negotiates deals with promoters, venues, talent buyers. A booking agent develops relationships. In some cases, they, you know, they purchase the travel, they create itineraries for artists, they issue contracts and invoices. And they also sometimes plan and strategize with an artist. Um, in my case, you know, oftentimes I do spend a lot of time, a lot more time strategizing because I work with a lot of smaller artists. But that's that's fundamentally what a booking agent does. Um, if if you're with a if you're in a bigger like kind of agency, you're not going to be doing some of the like travel and the itineraries that that would be the job of a bookings coordinator while the agent just sort of focuses on the deals and networking and relationships and uh well that's one thing i want to come back to um a little bit later is uh, you know the difference between a small agency and a big agency but uh let's let's continue uh you know at the high level um in the world of bookings, uh, you know, with all the artists you represent and every, everyone you've been talking to in the industry, how has the state of bookings in the industry changed pre-pandemic uh, to where we are now, kind of in the endemic phase or emerging out? Sure. Um, I mean, <laughs> everything is completely changed. <laughs> uh, there's, a, there's a lot. I mean, obviously, things shut down <laughs> for us. So I feel like I'm sort of restarting things all over again, uh, kind of trying to figure out where I left off. Um, you know, with, 
the current, basically with the current state of bookings, I, I mean, there's a lot more cancellations and postponements uh, right now going on. Obviously COVID has changed people's socializing habits, uh, like going to, it changes if people are actually going to events. So that's definitely affected things. I think a lot of promoters are booking more bread and butter artists. Uh, so that artists that are a surefire success, uh, rather than taking more chances on unknown or smaller artists. I, I would say that, I mean, it's, if you were to ask me like a year ago, like I, I would tell you maybe something a little different about the state of bookings in COVID because it just keeps changing every day. If, you know, if a variant surges up tomorrow, it's gonna be a completely different picture again. Um, but it, it, it seems that like places like Texas and Florida <laughs> And places like that will never shut down because they never shut down, period, <laughs> even totally. during COVID. You know? I mean, as a small aside, it feels like the Texas market in general is its own continent right now. I mean, that whole scene is uh, between all these new markets and all this blowing up. Um, Texas is actually a very, very exciting place for dance music. But I, I digress. Yeah. Um, so I, I think one of the interesting uh, things that you touched on, which I want to talk about, is Right now, promoters, they're, you know, there's a lot of debt they might have or, or, or risks they're not willing to take. So they're going with the bread and butter A-list artists, you know, who they know are going to fill the club and do all this. If, if you're an up and coming DJ and, uh, you know, let's say you're playing local gigs or you're trying to break out of your local city, what is the edge or what, what, what do you think is the best approach for um, the you know, the, the non-A-list headliner DJs to kind of make their way in this chaotic, unpredictable, um, low risk tolerance world? Um, you know, I, I would say if you're, you know, in this kind of environment, I think it's really important to sort of develop your own thing. Uh, meaning develop your own party in the city you live in, develop your own brand, hone, hone that in. Because, you know, if you're a local DJ, and, you know, I mean, obviously, Atish, you know this, uh, you, you went from being a local DJ to playing, you know, outside of your hometown, but everyone sort of, it's a different story for everyone. Um, and I think it's important to sort of, if you want to get recognized, like, like, in America or in the world, you really kind of need to hone in on like what your vision is for what you're doing. Uh, like maybe, you know, there's so many things you could do. You, you could release on labels outside of your local community or local, like outside of North America, if you really wanna get on a bigger world stage. Uh, it's, it's, it's tough right now, but I think if you come in there and really are focused and determined to sort of build your own thing, I think that can help you branch out further. You know, does, is that, I don't know if I'm answering Yeah, that. no, and, and I, I completely agree with that. Um, I mean, before the pandemic and even more so in the pandemic, I think there's like a three word philosophy that I've lived by and I try to advise my mentees to live by, which is control your destiny. I think, um, you know, if you're a great DJ or a great producer, you know, you can sit around waiting for people to book you or you can sit around waiting for your tracks to be signed. But I think, you know, the people who move the fastest and the people who make it to the top, the top are the ones who control their destiny. They, like you said, throw your own parties, start your own label, uh, you know, put together a collective um, and not be someone who's at the behest of some other people who have power and organizing yourself and, and moving forward. So, you know, this is something that I think has always been true, but as you're saying, especially in the pandemic, don't be afraid to start your own shit and, and yeah, just take the reins yeah, yourself. It's, it's really the key right now. Absolutely. Is honing um, in on doing your own thing. Yeah. And, um, you know, there's one thing you touched on, which is uh, a big one, which is, you know, you're talking about, you know, producing tracks and, and signing them to labels and, you know, hopefully labels that are outside your hometown. 
if you're an up and coming DJ um, or any kind of DJ, how important, so you're, you're booking DJs for DJ gigs, but obviously you're aware of the value that productions bring. Is it possible to be a pure DJ DJ in today's climate, or at least to ascend as a pure DJ? And relatedly, how important is it to have productions in order to make a name for yourself as a DJ? Um, now it's really important. I would say probably when I started listening to dance music, it wasn't. There's, cause I know artists that don't produce and they're successful DJs. However, in this day and age, it's all about content creation and your productions <laughs> are your content really. So it's, it's really important to get a, you know, to hone in on that skill. Uh, I don't, I do not agree that all producers are good DJs. <laughs> I, there's a lot of producers that I think aren't that great um, when it comes to DJing, but it, it does, it is an, a super added benefit to be producing as well. Absolutely. And I think, you know, my, my two cents on it, I mean, my personal story is how I came to be where I am. I mean, I am producing and releasing music now, but I was playing internationally in, let's say, 2013, 14, 15, without having it, had any productions. But that was at a time when people weren't on Spotify and SoundCloud was where all the energy was at. So, you know, I was doing monthly mixes and that's how I built a name for myself, you know, putting up a monthly podcast and people internationally were hearing it. But if I was to start my DJ career over again today, I mean, people are just moving in droves over to Spotify and you can't make a name for yourself with DJ mixes on Spotify. You know, you have to kind of go where the ears are. And for most people, that's where it is. So, you know, if you're a pure DJ and people are on Spotify, they're not going to hear you or it's going to be much, much harder to get your name out there. Plus, you know, 2013. Or you have a niche crowd that follows yes. you. If you're a pure DJ, like one example is someone like Bill Patrick. Yeah. Does not produce just DJs, but is the most amazing DJ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, he has a niche following and people will go see him because they know it's Bill Patrick. You know? Yeah. And he also has history. He came to rise at a time when it was okay to also be a pure DJ. I think it would, I mean, maybe similarly, I don't know if you agree, but if Bill Patrick were to start today, you know, doing what he does, it would be. Yeah, no, he wouldn't be where he is. Yeah. there's no way um so let's jump to the uh next question which is okay in, in relation to booking agents so let's say you're a dj you know you're you're pretty sure that you're a great dj you know you're crushing it on local gigs um let's say you even have you know a couple of releases out um you know on some labels um how does how does a dj begin a relationship with the booking agent how does that process or that that courtship um, work I, you know it's it the first step is just reaching out you know it, it, and a lot of times when you reach out you might find that you know a lot of booking agents won't pay attention in the mm -hmm. in the beginning uh i think you know some of it you know if you're asking like how do you get a booking agent to sort of sign you yeah. somewhat um, you have to sort of take your own initiative. Some of it is luck. I hate to say it. You just happen to be in the right place at the right time. Uh, you kind of, it, it you have to build yourself on your own in a very organized way for someone to consider to take you on. Uh, for me, it has to be a full package. You know, I, I see that the artist is working hard themselves. Uh, and they're making inroads and they're really going after it. Um, also, you know, I would ideally like to see an artist play live um, because it's an indicator to me of how they perform, uh, like sort of where they are at musically and where they can go musically. Um, I A lot of it is, for me, uh, taking on an artist is largely a gut instinct. Um, uh, some, sometimes I you know, hesitate to take someone on. 
sometimes it's because I don't have the bandwidth. <laughs> I, I like because you know you like right now it's like I I would say that that's largely the case for a lot of booking agencies agencies and booking agents is they don't have the bandwidth. Uh, they have lots of artists and. In order for an agent to dedicate their time to you, it requires a lot of mental, emotional, and physical energy uh, for them to do it. And what I mean by that is oftentimes emotional in the sense that sometimes you become someone's spiritual advisor when you become their booking agent. Um, mentally, like, you know, it, it takes, you know, it's just, it just takes a lot of brain power to like hone in and focus in on a specific artist. Uh, physically, it's taxing because it's a lot of hours of effort to build a new artist, an up and coming artist. So it's tiring because you're up late, like what, what can I do with this artist? What, who can I approach? Will they be convinced? Um, also physically, like, because I represent these sort of up and coming smaller artists, I oftentimes go to gigs. Uh, I go to festivals, I go to nightclubs, I go to, you know, whatever, whatever it takes for me to meet that promoter in person. <laughs> and meeting that promoter in person is everything. When uh, they are, you mean artists, right? DJ? Yeah, well, yeah, meeting the artists, but convincing a promoter oh, 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 gotcha. yeah, yeah. to book an artist. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's what I mean. Like physically, it's also exhausting for a booking agent. Sure. Um, uh, what... Cause like they're, they're operating, you know, day and night. So. Totally. Um, one thing you touched on is, um, you know, you like to have seen the artist play or, or have met them. How many, but you know, at the same time, it's also kind of take initiative and just email, you know, uh, email agencies and, and see what works. How many artists do you think you've signed or how common is it to bring an agent, uh, an artist to your roster who just cold emailed you out of the blue? Um, it's pretty tough actually, uh, if they just cold email me. Although I do like people that are persistent. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, because I feel if they're persistent, they're really sort of going after it, you know? Mm -hmm. They, they're, uh, I think that's a good thing. Um, but I, I think, you know, it's better to meet a, a booking agent in person, mm -hmm. you know, like, hey, I'm, I've been working on these things, great. And then usually someone will say to email them. <laughs> yeah. um, but I do, I do like persistence, you know. Absolutely. That's a, it's, it's a skill that's useful in, in, in all aspects of the industry. And, you know, there's, there's one interesting thing. I mean, Ganita, you've represented artists who are basically built from nothing like me, and you've also represented artists who are already, you know, commanding decent fees. But, um, you know, talking about the artists who are just kind of starting out, there's this uh, circular paradox, which is the artist wants to join a booking agency so they can start making money and, and, and start getting fees and playing more. And a booking agent is, I mean, an agency is a business. A booking agency wants to bring artists who, you know, they think are eventually going to make money. You know, they're going to invest time in them. So both, both parties, you know, are kind of hoping that the other party can, can help the other one. But the big thing that you mentioned was, um, you know, you want to see that an artist is working. You want to see proof of work, even if, uh, I don't want to put words in mouth, but even if you see someone, it just blew your mind on the dance floor. You know, they have a good personal vibe. They're an amazing DJ, but they haven't really proven that they want to do the work. You know, whether it's, you know, producing music or putting out mixes or participating in social media or any subset of those. Um, I think a booking agent wants to know that an artist is willing and trying to grow and isn't just going to put everything in the booking agents or everything in the manager's hands and just kind of wait for things to move forward. So I think proof of work and proof of vision is probably one of the more important things that you're looking for. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you have to like, the proof of work is everything, you know, I mean, I, like, 
like just just joining like if you have a booking agent doesn't mean that immediately your career is going to blow up you know uh i think uh if I don't see an artist's work ethic, then it's hard for me to sort of take them on, you know? Uh, I think it's, yeah, it, it, that's the most important thing. Yeah, they may have played like an amazing live show and all that, but if I don't see them doing like all the nitty gritty, then no, it, I would be a little hesitant. And then just rewinding back to one thing. So uh, cold emails, probably a low probability of you know, getting signed to an agency. Persistence helps for sure. But uh, let's just say I'm, you know, some guy off the street. I think I'm a great DJ. I play gigs once in a while here, there, and I want to be able to meet you or some agency or, or agent. I mean, and, you know, I'm, I'm a guy off the street. All the industry people are always backstage. I have no way to get a word in with you edgewise. Yeah. I mean, how does, how does the average Joe um, who's a great DJ, or uh, not, let's not say Amber Joe, but you know, the person who's not connected with the in industry, how do you make inroads in, in the industry to even have those conversations to show face in the first place? Yeah, I mean, I think it's important to just get involved in dance music in, mm -hmm. in any possible way you can, maybe not even as an artist playing, mm -hmm. you know? I, I know Atish, well, before you started uh, DJing, you you actually helped me project manage a Miami w Music Week, which back then was called Winter Music Conference. But uh, you actually got heavily involved in like the planning of events, um, and and then that's kind of how like the relationship developed. Yeah, uh, I mean that's a, that's a great point. I think you know I was going out two, three times a week in San Francisco and we would just see this uh, this person, Gunita, and, you know, and we would see you all the time and then I started talking to you and then I went to one of your parties in Miami, that, that Tiki Bo party, and then it like changed my life and it blew my mind. And then I was like, Gunita, and this was before I had even DJing, this was before I even wanted to DJ, you know, and I was like, Gunita, like what you're doing is amazing. How can I help you basically? And then like, you know, as you said, I started project managing and then I started DJing and, you know, that was kind of my end, just trying to benefit the scene. I, I wouldn't even say it was karma. I wasn't expecting anything in return, but it was a very organic way of just finding a way to participate. For some people it could be, okay, maybe I can work the door for your party, or maybe I can help you with your graphics or social media or, or whatever. Just finding a way to contribute to someone else's cause if you don't want to start your own is a great way to start building relationships. Yeah, I, I think it, it is like, you know, just getting in there and saying, how can I be part of this? Yeah. yeah. I, I find that really helps and gets people, um, but it, it gives you an opportunity to be in front of all the people in the industry. Totally. Um, there was a, uh, you kind of already answered this, but this is actually, I just want to drill down on a little bit more because I think there's this, misconception that um, once I join a booking agency, everything is going to change and I'm going to blow up and like all the momentum is going to happen. How much truth do you think there is to that statement? Um, and relatedly, what does the process of growth and blowing up actually look like? Um, it, it doesn't really happen that way. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's the real, really, uh, if you're you're starting off as an artist, it's a real process, you know, to build an artist and build their fees. It, it, it's in the beginning, you're going to be playing for almost nothing. <laughs> you're going to play for almost nothing and you're going to have to work hard. And uh, the, a booking agent oftentimes kind of can help an artist be taken more seriously, I guess. And um, for me, like I consider uh, my relationship with an artist as a partnership and it needs to be a team effort. Um, and and we, we, would, we have to be on the same page and have the same sort of realistic expectations of what this is gonna take to work, you know? Uh, because you're, just because you have an agent, you're not gonna go, your shoes, your fees aren't going to be like, oh my God, I have an agent. Now I'm going to make 
amazing fees. It's it never really goes down like that. Um, it does go down like that if you are if you you know maybe have a huge team of people behind you, <laughs> and you you know. But that that's a very different scenario, you know. Uh, but if you're just starting from scratch like this, it's it's it 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 is a long process, and you have you have to be willing to go down that road. The hustle never ends, you know. And um, you know, from the no. point from before I was a DJ and just getting my first gigs, I was hustling, talking to people, like maybe sometimes being more pushy than I should have. And actually, you know, Ganita, one thing I appreciate this was a few months back and uh, there was a festival that I had regularly been booked. And then one year I wasn't booked for that festival. And then you were like, well, Atish, have you ever gotten, you know, do you ever talk to that person who runs that festival? Like, do you get FaceTime in with him? I'm like, no, I don't know. I was just being shy. I didn't really want to like get involved, you know, get in his face. There's all these people talking to him. And then Ganita, you, you were like, no, you, you need to like get in people's faces and keep talking to them. Like you can't just and it was a reminder to me, you just can't let go of the gas because the hustle never ends. It, I mean, it gets, you know, to, to my level, whatever level that is, like I could probably coast for a little while, but if I let off the gas for too long, like it's all just going to disappear. Like it doesn't really, uh, that, that drive and that, that, that urge to keep moving forward and, and to keep doing those same things that I was doing when I started, you know, have to, that has to kind of be in your DNA to like, to keep wanting to do that. Like it doesn't, all of a sudden you just live like a life of luxury where you don't have to work and everything comes to you. You know, maybe for a select few artists or if you release a summer bomb or something, everyone's knocking at your door, but the hustle never really ends. I mean, would you agree with that? I guess yeah, that's what you just said. It, it's the, 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 that, that, that is just an exception when there's an artist that immediately blows up, you know, that, that is so far and few between. And, and those artists typically have massive teams. They're like, they have a team built, ready to go. It's almost like, I almost feel some of those artists are manufactured <laughs> in a weird way. And I, I think, you know, like, like I'm, I'm not like trying to pick on an artist particularly, but they're, they, these artists, like some of these artists are manufactured superstars, I guess. Yeah. But for um, most people, that's the exception. And it is really the hustle. hundred <laughs> percent. It never yeah. ends. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, as a, it's, it's not the most romantic thing to say, but as solo artists, we are artists, but we're also entrepreneurs. We're also, we're a business and uh, you have to keep growing your business. You have to keep marketing. You have to manage a team. You have to overlook finances. And um, if you're the CEO of a company or a startup, I mean, that hustle never ends. It's, it's, you always have to be, you know, thinking about growth and growing, and uh, it can be very emotionally taxing. Um, but the rewards, you know, when when things are going well, uh, in my opinion, have been, you know, worth it to keep doing it. But yeah, it never ends. Um, so you know, we're we're hearing a lot, um, you know, on, on your perspective of what a booking agent is looking for to bring to your roster. But uh, you're also a promoter, and obviously, you work with promoters all the time, trying to pitch your artists to them. What are promoters looking for when trying to book DJs? Sure. Um, well, they like to book artists that market their events with consistency, um, and they don't. You don't have to remind artists. I think promoters are also looking to pull the numbers for their events, quite frankly, and uh, so you know they they want an artist that you know brings in the numbers, has the right vibe, you know, that they're engaged with their audience. Uh, promoters don't wanna deal with difficult artists. Uh, they like artists that are professional and um, professional and they can, you know, they're successful with these artists, you know? And promoters also like loyalty, you know? They like when an artist continues to play for them, you know? Um, so it, uh, promoter, I mean, because I, I used to throw events, you know, those, at least those are the things that I like to see, you know? Um, let's just take a quick pause here. Um, does anyone have any questions or anything they wanna 
toss out from what they've heard so far or should we keep going? Feel free to, oh, I see a hand raised. I don't know how to, oh, from Farah. Yeah, uh, you can unmute if you like. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you guys for the, for the chat. Uh, it's a great, great um, insight. Um, my question is basically um, when, when you're taking on, you know, new artists and stuff, and obviously there's that kind of, there's that line between, you know, um, and I know Atish, you went through this, which was basically having a job and then making that transition um, into full time. So do, would you consider um, up and coming artists who have you know, and another another job at that at that point to kind of obviously make ends meet and whatnot. Um, and in tandem to that, how how like what, with your artists, do you expect them to play every single weekend if possible out of those fifty two weeks, or what what is the frequency? Or does that depend completely on your relationship with the artist? Um, wait, can you clarify the first question? Uh, first question is: Would you consider taking on an uh, an up and coming artist who has another another who's in another industry who has a job? Yeah, um, actually, yes, I, I like that because then if they have another job, I feel like they're super organized. Uh, they have to be very structured in their routine. Um, uh, so I I I'm open to taking on artists that do other things. Yes, definitely. And then, no, I don't, I don't need an artist that tours every weekend uh, because I have a big enough roster that, that I, if in, another artist is not working, I have somebody else, uh, you know, I, and, and that's mainly because I, I, I'm a smaller booking agency, boutique agency. If I was, if this was a bigger agency, they want artists to tour every week and they can because they make their money based on that huge amount of volume. Um, and they need that volume to sustain their agency. Like, if, does that make sense or did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah, no, no, absolutely. Just, you know, just kind of mindful of, um, you know, the fact that maybe some artists don't want to tour that that heavily, but um you know does it devalue them to the in the eyes of an agent because the artist doesn't want to do that um, yeah, thanks, no thanks i don't think so it, it's I, also, at least not for me um i think it's also interesting when you have um an artist who already has a full-time job they are less and let's just say they're not financially independent or wealthy otherwise um if they're completely dependent on gigs or you getting them bookings um, because they don't have other income coming in it can create for maybe a desperate situation or a high stress situation, or maybe you end up looking for gigs or placing them in gigs that don't align with the best strategy for growth long term. So having a, a financial backbone with a day job can actually make it easier to execute uh, with a medium or long term plan of what you actually want to do. So you're not taking these cheesy gigs or wedding gigs or, or you know these you know these types of things which are actually maybe detracting from what you really should be doing. Yeah, and it's a lot of pressure on a booking agent to deliver <laughs> deliver week yeah. after week for an artist. I, I I have had some artists like that, and it was pretty stressful <laughs> um, because they relied on this income, and I understand. Um, and and they were not like a high level huge artist, so it was a lot more stressful for them, you know, and challenging for me. Um, thanks for the question, Farah. Questions? Uh, Javi, you have uh, your hand raised. Yep. Um, talking about like creating your own parties, your own events, uh, that's something I've been thinking for a while. And I, I threw a little event. The thing is, like, when you're starting from scratch, it's kind of like such a huge leap. You have to get a lot of people to go to some place, you have to rent a venue. There's a lot of like things to take into account. And you're basically a complete noob when you start. <laughs> So like, I was wondering like, what kind of advice or uh, do you have to kind of like mitigate all these risks? Because the, the risk seems pretty high for the first few events at least until you start to make a name. Um, I, I would say, you know, um, I mean, if you establish a relationship with a venue where you're not taking all the risk, uh, I think that's ideal. 
So you partner up with a venue that you feel has the right vibe. It feels good to you. And, and then you're not, you're not, you know, producing a full party. Um, uh, let me give you an example. Like I, like when I did throw parties, I, I had a relationship with the end up in San Francisco and we shared the risk of parties, the bringing the artist in and, you know, uh, you know, we, we shared everything. So it wasn't so stressful. So I think that's kind of the way you have to do it unless you're well-funded, which most people aren't. <laughs> so, you know, uh, other, otherwise I would say you should find someone that can fund you. <laughs> Find a benefactor. Uh, and in, yeah, find a benefactor that, that's willing to do this, you know. And so, um, yeah, uh, I mean, it's a tough one, but, you know, I, I it's, it's, sorry about that. There's, uh, uh, <laughs> I have, I, I thought I turned off my iMessage, but it didn't turn off. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's just challenging to start off. I, I, I totally sympathize with you. But if you're driven to do it, you'll make it work somehow. Um, Atish, I don't know if you have any. Yeah, I think another thing to add um, is, especially if you're you know someone who wants to make a name for yourself, but maybe you're an introvert or you're not friends with everyone in the scene or, you know, or you just moved to a new city and, and you know, uh, you're trying to, build a name for yourself. I think partnering with people is uh, also really good. And Javi, we, we talked about this before. Um, you know, maybe you're, you can do all the sound, you can obviously DJ, you can do this, but you find someone who's in the scene who has a lot of friends who can build people and you both just draw on, and that person maybe doesn't even DJ at all, or that person is just uh, a promoter, you know? And um, I think joint ventures or setting up, uh, not communes, uh, collectives. Um, collective, a, a collective. Yeah, you can distribute your financial risk. You know, people can focus on what their strengths are and you can all kind of move and, and do that together. And I think um, related to that, uh, you know, for me, one thing I had early on, I was, uh, I was a resident of a party. It was called Two Two Tuesday. It was a monthly party. And maybe there's already, a, you know, someone who who's doing events, you know, regularly. Um, maybe you don't have to start your own thing up, but you can build a relationship with them. Say, hey, I would love to be the resident for your party. You know, I can play for you monthly or however frequently you're doing it. I can guarantee you that I won't play, you know, for other venues in the same week kind of thing. Um, residencies are another really, really good thing because you can jump onto another promoter's social capital and goodwill they've built. And also when you're playing for that promoter regularly, now you're building up your own audience as well. And maybe you want to branch off and do your own thing after you've shown enough face for, for that same. Yeah, audience. You, you can become a resident of a venue or a collective. Venue too. Um, you know, that, that's how ever, that's how most people get started. It's just super organic, mm -hmm. you know, and it, then it becomes, I mean, it starts organic and then it can, it can blow into something a lot bigger, you know? Yeah. Um, cool. Any other questions? Yeah. Or um, oh, oh, go ahead, Javi. I have a second question, but like, I want to let anyone else maybe ask. I don't want to take all the time. I don't see any other hands up. So, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, go ahead. So um, uh, basically, as we talk, when an artist is just starting, even if he's learning how to produce or he's making productions, he's still not making a splash. He still doesn't have a following. He, sorry, they still don't have a following. So as a booking agent, like, how do you convince a promoter to book these small artists that it's like unknown? Like what's in it for them? That's like, that's the, the part like that I cannot quite grasp yet. Like what's the value proposition for them? Is it trusting your the relationship you established with them for a while, like betting on the future? Like what's so wait, have to get something out of it. Can you sort of just so I'm understanding the question right? Um, maybe maybe I could summarize in a one liner. I think it's saying, why would a promoter want to place a bet on a small time artist who doesn't yet have a name for himself? What are the compelling arguments you can make to a promoter to want to book? Uh, a lesser known artist. Is that right, Javi? Um, yeah, around those lines, yeah. Uh, a lesser known artist, you know, 
it's it's tough because you know it, it, it's it's hard to convince a promoter to book a lesser known artist um but it is possible you know sometimes you know just playing for somebody and maybe not asking for a fee the first time or the first few times so that the the promoter can get used to you know your sound and if they like you they'll bring you aboard you know uh it's it i can't say it's easy uh to do that to convince someone <laughs> uh when or to take a chance on someone like that um i mean i don't know it's he like I, I think um so this is actually one of the advantages of working with an agency. And I, I actually don't know if you do this or not, but I know other agents that I've worked with do this, which is when you're aboard an agency and let's say you're kind of at the bottom of the ladder um, and then you have an, an artist who's at the top of the ladder, a lot of times booking agents, I don't even know if this is ethical or not, but they'll play hardball with the promoter. <laughs> they'll say, hey, you book my A-list artist, but I also oh, want you yeah. to put you know this up and comer on the artist, trust me, they wouldn't be on my agency if I didn't believe in them, but just take my word for it. It comes as a package deal. And this is a way that promote our booking yeah, agency no, is their sorry. leverage. I, yeah. I, then I misunderstood the question. Like if, I mean, obviously there's the difference between a bigger artist and a smaller artist on a roster. Uh, the, the bigger artist, you know, to some extent, you know, can be used if someone wants to book a teach then it's easier for me to leverage the situation and say, well, you know, you should book, you know, X artists with a teach, you know, uh, that's, that's a way oftentimes that I can get a promoter to agree to things. I, I typically don't do that. Yeah. Um, but some of the bigger agencies definitely do that. Yeah. Um, um. This is only helpful advice if you're already on an agency, but you know, I think if you're not yet signed with the agency, it's basically it's tough. And I think there's one thing, actually, I just want to spend 30 seconds talking about what you touched on, which is a lot of times in my Facebook and Instagram feed, I see these, you know, little text posts saying like, never play for free, like you should know your worth, you know, like never sell yourself short, like, you know, aspire to the amount of money you want to make in this kind of thing. And I think I have I think I agree with you. I have a very unpopular opinion, which is like, I played for free a lot. I mean, early on, you know, a lot of gigs in New York, I would lose money on gigs. And, um, you know, having a day job where I was able to support myself made that possible. But um, early on, being open to the idea that you might lose money on gigs, I mean, it's, it feels like on PC to say this because we should feel like we're worth something, but we are, but I just see it as an investment in myself in the future. So. I'm, I'm comfortable saying, I mean, I still play gigs sometimes where I walk away with almost nothing, um, or I think I've even lost money on international gigs. Um, and I'm fine with that because, you know, it's thinking about the bigger picture, how everything fits together. Um, I think that's okay. You have to do that in the beginning as you're building yourself as an artist. Um, you know, you have to be prepared to lose money or earn almost nothing or break even or, you know, it's, it's, it's just the way you, you will build yourself, you know? Hey, Jack Powell, uh, yeah, you can uh, unmute with your question. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I wondered if you had any advice. Um, so um, my, my friend and I uh, put on parties in, in our local area, but um, the genre, genre that we play is, isn't is probably the most popular and it, it competes with other other genres that kind of saturate the, the area that, that we that we, that we live in. So I wondered if you had any advice on how to potentially kind of stand out or whether, whether the, you know, there's a, it's just a case of being consistent or, you know, you have to take a risk on, you know, potentially booking a big, a big artist that could potentially pull in, pull in a crowd, something like that. Um, I would say sometimes you have to bring in bigger artists. Mm -hmm. um, to pull a crowd because it'll help you stand out. You have to take, especially if you're throwing parties consistently, um, it, it'll it just help you stand out uh, amongst other promoters. Um, you know, it's, it's, a lot, it's a lot of risk taking <laughs> in dance music. Um, I've taken a lot of risk <laughs> uh, 
uh, on parties, artists, everything, you know. Uh, so like to be sort of in dance music, you have to have this kind of disposition or uh, willing to take risk on really everything. Um, so yeah, I, I would say for you guys to stand out, you're you're probably going to have to have a bigger artist play and also like your production and the artwork that you convey, your marketing and your promotion also has to stand out. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Okay, bro. Thank you. That makes sense. Uh, Shravan, were you able to sort out your microphone issue? Yeah. Can you guys hear me? Yep. You got right. Shravan, then we'll jump to Drew next. Yep. Sorry about that. Of um, yeah, so uh, hello everyone. I'm based out of Chicago. I'm a, I'm, I work full time in IT and I'm a DJ and I'm also a promoter. So uh, I started doing this promotion and throwing parties in Chicago since last two years, right before COVID. So uh, right now with following up with what the conversations that we're having right now and the discussions. So the follow up question what I have is, uh, when I reach out, ex explore this artist, uh, could be a tier one or tier two or tier three, and uh, I know I want to bring him to Chicago and I reach out who this agency is, who he works for. The first question is they ask me, how much are you are ready to offer? So how do I know what is the right amount for this artist? And uh, uh, okay. <laughs> um, it, you know, how, how do you know? You, you need to talk to, you need to uh, talk to other people in dance music, to be honest. Like, uh, people come to me all the time and ask me, uh, you know, I want to make an offer for X artists. What, do you think this is reasonable? And I'll tell them yes or no. I'll say, no, you're going to have to offer this much. You just, it's a matter of speaking to someone knowledgeable in dance music. Uh, sometimes in the beginning, when you start throwing parties, especially in this day and age, uh, you sometimes have to ask the agency, like, um, like, what is the budget for this artist, or what, what do you, what fee are you expecting? Unfortunately, in the beginning, you have to do that because they've never worked with you before. Um, so you, in some sense. I'm not going to say you're going to get screwed, but in some sense, people are going to quote you higher rates for an artist than they might quote somebody else um, because they're they're thinking, oh, you're new to this game. Oh, we're going to like, you know, give him the maximum we would want for an artist like this. Um, but as you kind of get comfortable with throwing parties and events, this you'll you'll soon learn like what's appropriate for a tier one or a tier, whichever kind of artist you're booking and and you know if if you're an honest booking agent though you know then you're gonna you're gonna throw out reasonable fees to promoters uh some of the bigger agencies you know they they're gonna throw you higher fees because or if it's an artist they're, bu they're building, they might be a little more reasonable with you. Um, but oftentimes a booking agent wants to see that a promoter has uh, some history, you know? And I know when you're starting out, you don't have that history. Um, and, but that's okay. Like I'm still willing to work with people that don't have history as long as they can prove to me that they're handling things and they're doing, you know, they're, they're going through all the motions of what uh, a production or a promoter does. You know? And I, I think this also kind of works into why being on a roster is really great. So let's say Srovan, you're asking for one of the tier one artists and Ganita says, well, I don't know how you yet do events, but maybe you have, you know, one of your tier two or three, tier three artists who maybe aren't as busy, and you can say, like, let's just send them out on a scouting mission. You know, say, how about, you know, let's do a booking with, you know, one of my less expensive or, you know, up and coming artists. And then that can be kind of a good test the waters kind of thing. I think we might have yeah. done this a couple of years. Uh, test the waters kind of thing. The artist will report back to the agency saying, like, yeah, they have their act together. And then the agent will be more comfortable uh, sending out, you know, one of, one of the big artists. So it's not always about 
money. I mean, I, I know for us when, you know, when we talk about gigs, it's not always, you know, who, who's the highest bidder. You know, we also want to make sure that the sound is good, the lighting is good, that the crowd is right, you know, that, that it all makes sense together. So money is part of it, but it's also the full package. Thank you. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, Drew? Hey, hey guys. I uh, hope you can hear me okay. Um, so I, I know that, you know, a lot of your artists are, you know, national, international. Um, so this uh, might be a little bit of an extrapolation or just drawing on your history, but uh, I want to talk about saturation, right? So I'm, I'm in the, the point right now where I can get books a decent amount uh, in New York and just trying to figure out, you know, when I need to start thinking about kind of restricting myself from playing or if I should just be out there um, playing as often as I can and how that's going to, you know, kind of affect the dynamics of how I'm going to play. Get that, Kenia? Yeah, so... So what, what is the exact question though? Like it's about um, sort of. I, yeah, I, I guess to, to clarify that it'd be, uh, how do you kind of gauge when an artist has saturated the market versus when they need to kind of cool off? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think when you're building yourself, I think it's okay to saturate yourself a bit um, in the beginning, um, but I do, I do think as you start to build yourself and you, you're, you know, trying to make yourself more scarce and valuable, you have to be, uh, you know, you should play a market a lot less. Um, you know, but I, I understand the need to play a lot in the beginning because you want people to hear you. And, um, but as you, you know, as time goes by, you should, like, I would say you, like a market like New York, you should only play like once a quarter as, as you know, or as you're building yourself. I know, I know in the beginning, you're going to probably play as many gigs as possible. And, you know, also being a little bit select about the gigs you actually play. Um, you know, it's, I don't know if that answered your question, but. I think from, uh, yeah, that's good. yeah, I think from like my perspective, at least, you know, coming up in San Francisco, kind of in line with that early on, I was playing not as much as I could, but if I would try not to play more than once a weekend, um, to not piss off, you know, other promoters. And then as, as I got more and more established in SF, I tried to play less and less. So every gig would be more special. Um, this doesn't apply in SF, but more in New York, if, where there's a lot of different scenes. So let's just say there's kind of a, a bottle service scene and there's like more of a bohemian scene and there's like an underground warehouse scene. If you can divide your gigs up amongst different scenes and audience, audiences, so you feel a bit more fresh. Um, that's always a nice thing to do. I mean, good need and I, I mean, we, we try and do that in New York now, um, you know, try and make sure we're not playing for the same people every single time. So every time I do play, it's in a, you know, in a different kind of sub scene or some genre. Um, and then I think another good measure is if you do have a following and if you're like concerned about perhaps playing too much, um, if you start seeing that your following gets less excited to see you play or they're not, you know, if people are following you as a DJ to come play, and if you're just observing and you're seeing that it's starting to taper off, that could just kind of be a signal that uh, maybe I'm playing too much for that crowd, or maybe I should start thinking about other crowds. But long story short, I think it's a. Uh, it's good to play for different scenes. I, uh, yeah. The whole idea of like you know what you're just talking about, you know, sort of dabbling in this and dabbling in the Burning Man kind of scene and all that. I, I think that's that's a good, uh, you know but just keep it limited you you do want to keep yourself a little bit valuable or a little bit scarce you know yep. um so we're just above the one hour mark um i made it about halfway through my questions but that's okay i think uh we covered a lot of ground here um i'll just open up the floor one last time to see if there's any questions to uh close things out um yeah i don't see any more so Gunia, do you have any 
final closing thoughts about, uh, let's say, the, the world of bookings advice to up and coming DJs? Let, let's start there. Do you have any high level closing thoughts on what you would advise an up and, up and coming DJ to make their way up? Yeah, I mean, I think if this is really what you want to do, you just have to be like set your eye on the prize and be focused and determined to do this. It's, it's not an easy road. <laughs> it's quite a struggle um, because the music industry is, you know, it, it's a lot of ups and downs. And so you really, if you're signing up to do this and you wanna, and this is what you wanna do, then you have to sort of be prepared uh, mentally and emotionally and physically to, to handle all this. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's great that you are all, you know, uh, I, I think it's great that you guys are all part of this uh, sort of group with Atish because uh, Atish is like, to me, like, like a star uh, artist to work with. Um, he really, you know, he, he literally started with nothing and, and, you know, and aimed high and, you know, put his head to the ground and, and went for it. Um, I, I don't think there could be a better example of somebody who uh, is, I think, doing it right. Um, so. Thanks, uh, Gunia. <laughs> yeah, what, well, I, I owe, uh, you know, a lot to you as well. I mean, you, you believed in me from before the beginning and, uh, you know, the way you operate, um, you know, outside, you know, strategy, which is great, but, you know, work ethic and being truthful and honest uh, completely aligns with the way I like to do things. So I think we have a good uh, working relationship with each other. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty awesome. And friendship, you know. Yes. Yeah. I mean, friendship. Yeah. Like I said, uh, friendship, borderline family. A, a lot of people lovingly referred to Ganita as mother goose because she's always yeah. taking care of everyone. Yeah. Um, but definitely. Um, well, awesome. So I guess we'll just uh, wrap it up there. Ganita, thanks so much for your time. I hope all of you found this really valuable. Um, as mentioned at the beginning, if you're not part of the Patreon program, this is a, a public peek into the artist mentorship program that I have. Um, I think I have a slot opening up next week. So you're welcome to apply uh, if you want to join the program, atishmusic.com slash artist mentorship, but no pressure, no stress. If not, just happy to have you all here and uh, hope you have something to take away from it. Thanks everyone. Thanks yeah, for tuning in. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks guys. Thank you. It was great. Thank you. Awesome. All right.